The first question on our list was, uh, what was the inspiration for the characters' names? Uh, and this is for Shipbreaker, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, I, I choose names for a bunch of different reasons. Um, you know, there are certain characters like Nailer or Tool. Um, I'm actually trying to evoke something about them that's going to hold with the character um, and hold with the reader's head sort of as they're, as they're reading that character. And, and so, you know, the, the same reasons that Richard chose the name Nailer are, are things that I want the reader to be thinking about. I want him to be tough. I want you to think of him as scrappy. I want you to think of him as being uh, also kind of a, a, a piece of junk, you know? He's like this little, like, he's a little nail. <laughs> he's pokey and he stands up, you know? And so there's some things like that that I wanted to have in there. Um, but in other cases, it's... Uh, I, I'm just looking for sounds that, that appeal to me for some reason, and and so I'll be looking, you know, a sloth. Sloth was another name I wanted to have on there, right? Um, but uh, yeah, there are other names that I'm just sort of, I, I'll, I'll go through sort of lists of making different names. I was like, is it a short name or is it a long name? Um, in some cases, uh, you're just looking for the right sounds. And, and so I went through a bunch of different, you know, with Nita, I went through a bunch of different Indian names before I decided that one sounded right to me. And and I don't even know why. Like, I'm just like, yep, works, that's the one. And, you know, it's a, it's like naming children or whatever. You're like, yeah, I'll try it for a while. Okay, there, that, that seems real. Okay, we're going to go with that. So. All right, so you did answer one of the other questions I did have, and it was like, did you think of a real name for Naylor? Because, you know, like, all the names, they kind of se- sound like nicknames. Right. So, Naylor was his real name? Yeah, and okay. and that's one of the... I mean, you know, I, the names are weird that way, just sort of in terms of, like, you know, how much do you want to feel like it's, like, real set in this present day versus somewhere futuristic versus... And, and I mostly just want to break the rules or do whatever seems to feel right, and I don't even know why that is a lot of times. But, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are certain kids. Who, it's certain certain times, you know, there's there's somebody you you know you Candless with Captain Candless. You only ever I think know his last name. You never know his first name. But like you know, in other characters, you never actually find out if they have first, middle, last, what. Yeah. You know. So yeah. So his na- his full name is Naylor Lopez. Right? Yes. Okay. Another one we have is where do you get the ideas for your story? Well, um, so with Shipbreaker, uh, there were some some things I was thinking about already. Uh, I was already thinking about global warming. I was already thinking about questions about what kind of... Uh, I, I was thinking about peak oil and things like that. What would happen if we ran out of cheap energy and how would we adapt or fail to adapt? Would we plan to it or fail to plan for it? And so some of those things were in my head already. There's things like Hurricane Katrina uh, was on my mind, because mm-hmm. um, when I was uh, writing it, I think it was only a couple of years after Katrina, and so that had been really interesting to watch New Orleans just get smashed by this hurricane, and then it was also interesting to watch how badly we sort of responded to it. Um, but then it was interesting to sort of look at the, the, the climate data and say, New Orleans is never going to be less vulnerable. They're only going to get more and more vulnerable. There will only be more and more hurricanes. The sea levels will only get higher and higher. New Orleans is in a terrible, terrible place. And so it was really interesting to me when people started talking about rebuilding New Orleans, too, because you're thinking, no, 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 wait, like when it gets smashed once like that, you don't go back to the same spot and get smashed again. And and that struck me as like, there's this sort of quality of hubris that we have where we, we think we can just go where we want and do what we want. And it's like, well, no, nature might have some other plans for us here. And uh, all of those kinds of things end up being, they, they're just the kinds of information that you just absorb all the time as an author. You're just always reading different things and, and you aren't quite sure why those details hold with you. Um, but then when I sat down to start writing the story about Naylor, um, I, I knew I wanted to write it in this this future. And there were some specific things that I was really thinking about. One of them was that I had just seen this documentary uh, about a photographer named Edward Bertinsky. And he, uh, he went around and did these amazing photographs. And the whole series was called Manufactured Landscapes. And it was all places where human beings have changed the world, like where We've, we've shifted the entire landscape of a, of a large space. So we'd go around like taking photos of things like Kennecott Copper Mine, which is just like basically they just dug a mountain into reverse. It's massive. It's just a giant hole in the ground. And, like, and uh, you know, he would go and you know, uh, take photos of like these giant uh, factories in China. Um, 
But one of the places that he went was the shipbreaking yards in Chittagong in Bangladesh, and that's where our ships go to die. And uh, and the images were incredibly stark and surreal. Like looking at Chittagong through his photographic lens was just I, I couldn't get those images out of my head. And um, and then the other thing that was really interesting to me was that knowing something about the shipbreaking industry is that for the for people in Bangladesh. We think of it as waste disposal. We're basically dumping our toxic ships on some other poor country that doesn't have any environmental laws. <laughs> and we're like, here, take our junk. Um, but for them, it's it's not junk disposal, it's mining. Um, these are raw resources. And, and that was interesting to me because when you're thinking about what does a scarcity society look like, what does a resource poor society look like, it's one that values junk you know, quote unquote, in a really, really different way. And so like, you know, so the idea that you would be mining ships for these raw materials was was something that also really sort of stuck in my head. And that was the, the jumping off point for the whole book. Uh, why was Naylor's father so abusive? And like, did you always know that you were gonna like kill him off in the book? Yes, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> So I moved around a lot as a kid, and uh, one of the places I lived in was really pretty terrible. And um, and a lot of my friends had had really really scary relationships with their families. Um, there was a girl I knew who, um, at one point, uh, she needed to move out of her house, and a whole bunch of us, this was when we were in high school, were helping her live in different houses of ours. Like she would come and stay at one person's house, and we were sort of scheming to sort of move her around through enough different houses until her father went back onto, I can't remember, it was like night shift or whatever, so that he wouldn't be around when she went home. <laughs> And it was this weird thing where you realize that family actually isn't everything. Um, and that family, you know, the, there's all this sort of talk about blood being thicker than water and stuff. And I don't really believe it. Um, I think that all relationships are conditional. And you want to look at, like, whether somebody is decent to you and supports you and cares for you. And that's the basis of true family, if you want to say it. But all these other things are just you know, lies, basically. And there was something about when I was writing this book, I really wanted to sort of talk about that and sort of put a real, like, pointer on this idea that family wasn't it. It's these other kinds of supports, people who reach in and care for you. Um, it's really important to me, actually. Um, and I myself, because I moved around so much, I ended up with a lot of... Um, and my mother had to move a lot, and sometimes I would end up living with other people's families. Uh, adoptively kind of for periods of time for a couple of weeks or for a month I'd live at different houses and and so that my mom could go out and do her work and and so I ended up with like all these surrogate families that ended up supporting me and um, and that's important uh, to me for some reason and uh, it really uh, I wasn't expecting I wasn't expecting the focus of the story to be so much about family um, when I when I was writing it I knew Richard Lopez was gonna be a bad guy and I knew Naylor was gonna have to deal with him and um, but uh, I didn't know that that was going to be the heart of the story. Um, and so, and as I got about halfway into the book, I was like, I had thought that um, Naylor challenging his father was going to be maybe two-thirds of the way through the book and there was still going to be more to go. And then suddenly I realized, no, no, this is it. Like, this is Naylor challenging his father is going to be everything in this story. And, um, and I, that was unexpected for me. It was sort of discovered that, like, oh, this is the biggest, most important piece. I know that, knew that those pieces were going to be there, but I didn't realize how important they were to me until I was halfway into the book. And then suddenly I was like, no, no, that's, that's what this story is about. I thought it was about sustainability or about peak oil or, you know, broken futures. No, no, it's about Naylor and his father and family and support. Why was oil such a big part of the book? One of the things that I've been sort of watching for a long time is the question of how much oil is actually available to us and how dependent we are on it. Um, you know, oil sort of underlies almost all of our prosperity. Um, it's not just transportation, it's also cheap oil makes it easy for us to farm, you know, thousands and thousands of acres with huge machinery. Um, it allows us to create uh, nitrogen fertilizer. It allows us to do a whole bunch of things that, like, you know, sort of are invisible but create prosperity for us. Um, and the truth is, is that we will run out. Um, you know, no matter how many technological sort of tricks we come up with, there is a finite supply of this, and 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 yet we have a very hard time coming to grips with that idea that that something that's fundamental to everything, from making the plastics that end up going into our computers to um, powering our cars to making our food, um, we're dripping in oil, basically. And 
and yet we don't engage with the idea of what would happen if we're done with it, if it just becomes too expensive, too difficult to go after. Um, and we know it's getting more and more difficult. The amount of technology and the amount of ingenuity we have to use to go after the dregs of oil that we go after now is completely different than when they used to sort of punch a hole in the ground and it would spout out. Um, you know, now you have to go and you know go into the Gulf of Mexico and you have to you know drill twenty thousand feet down through water and ground before you get you know oil. And it's like a lot of innovation to go after not much return in a lot of ways, but we're desperate for it. And so I was curious about that and I wanted to think about it. Another question that we had on this is kind of go back and, and touching on like uh, Richard Lopez. What is Crystal Sly? Because like he, you talked about that a lot. Like what <coughs> drug are you trying to reference? Uh, I was uh, I was trying to uh, reference an amphetamine based drug. Um, so something that makes you high, fast, uh, highly engaged, focused, um, all of those things. So speed um, yeah. or crystal meth or you know any of those kinds of things yeah, but because, it's like, amphetamine it, but not explicitly but I wanted it to feel slightly different than I didn't you don't want something to seem so immediate in our world that it pops you out of the story like you want it to seem somehow altered and so that was you know so you ha so I needed new terms for drugs I needed new terms I needed new slang for for curses I needed all these things to be slightly different but reference back you're hoping to things that we're aware of already so that you would think oh yeah he's on amphetamines clearly um, when did you start writing and what made you start writing? Um, I started writing I started writing when I was about 24 um, and I, I actually started writing because I hated my day job. Um, uh, I originally, I, I, my, my parents were kind of hippies, very alternative people, and, uh, and I hated that. And I really, really wanted to have a real job, like live in the suburbs with a house, you know, with like, I wanted to, I wanted to live in a house where, <laughs> you know how the curbs on <laughs> sidewalks are kind of rolled? I wanted to live in a suburb with rolled sidewalk edges, <laughs> like, because that felt like, I don't know, real life somehow, like, you know, normal life, um, instead of parents who, you know, want to live in teepees and things like that, right? So when I graduated from college, I was determined to go into business and make money and, you know, all those kinds of things. And uh, so originally I worked in business in China, actually, and then, uh, and then I went into internet development and did a lot of uh, internet consulting work um, back when the internet was first getting going. Um, and I, each time I sort of found that I could make a lot of money and I could be successful and I also was emotionally miserable. Um, and, and I started writing on the side uh, on weekends just to sort of feel like I had some kind of a, a respite from the work. Um, the, rest, the work felt really dumb and pointless and I wanted to have something that felt like it was at least mine. Um, so it started as a hobby and then I became more and more obsessed with it as I did it. I was like, oh, I really like this. I really like this. And then I was like, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to spend all my savings. I'm going to write a novel. And, um, and uh, I did write the novel. I told everybody at work that I was going to go write a novel so that I couldn't back out. You know, I sort of like, you know, burn your boat on the shore so you can't retreat. It was, um, I told everybody um, that I was quitting to write a novel. Um, and I did go off and write that novel, but it did not get published. Um, and so that was the first of many failures for me with novels. So what I would do is I would write, uh, I would sort of get a job, save up a bunch of money, and then quit, and then spend it all while I wrote the next book, and then fail to get it sold, and then I'd have to go back and get another job, and then I'd earn more money and save it up, and then I'd quit again, and I just would do that again and again. I did that for four books, and uh, it was a total failure. It took like, I, it took like 12 years before I was really starting to get published, but. You talked about in like the books the the people in there kind of like relied on their gods most of the time. So like, why didn't some of the rich people help like the poor people in that book? Rich people don't give a fuck about poor people. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, when 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 have rich people ever? Cared to solve the problems of poor people, genuinely. Well, like, not um, solve, but, you know, at least try and help, because, you know, like, you talked about, like, having, like, like, Naylor, kind of, is, like, helped by the fates and the gods and stuff like right. that. Right, he perceives himself but, like, as being helped by luck or by fates, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. but, like, why don't some of the rich people try and gain some luck or, you know, help from the gods by, like, giving some to get more? The people who are relying on fate, on superstition, on the idea of luck or, 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 or um, some destiny, um, those kinds of things, 
These are people who really actually have almost no control over their destiny at all. Um, and so Naylor and his crew are in a set of situations where their set of options is so absolutely limited that there is no perception that they have actual control or mastery over their world. Um, they have luck and the occasional good day, and that's what they got. Um, the rich in this world, people like Nita or um, you know the people who run you know Lawson and Carlson or any of the other major corporations and stuff like that, they have a perception that they have complete mastery. They don't have gods. They have they have wealth and power. <laughs> like that's that's where the luck is, and it reinforces itself. The more wealth and power you have, the more wealth and power you get. Um, so because they have those levers of control, that means that you don't have that sense of like that the, the gods or the fates or anything. They have the sense that like, oh no, I'm the master of the universe. I am my own master. Um, and that's a completely different, you know, engagement with the world based on experience. Um, so that's sort of what's going on to me in that story at least. So. Uh, this is kind of a girly question, but um, uh, why not a lot of romance between Lula and there's no good reason. Mostly, the the main reason was I didn't have time. Um, there's some sometimes there's a because I, I actually wanted that romance to, to sort of blossom more. And actually, I I'm a big fan of romances and romantic comedies and a whole bunch of things. I love them actually. Uh, I'm a real sucker for that stuff. And um, it was interesting because uh, what I found was that the propulsion of the plot was moving so quickly that there wasn't really much room. At some point, the story had its own rhythm. Uh, and, and so suddenly it was like, oh, I wanted to have more interactions between Naylor and Anita. I wanted their relationship to become much more solidified. I wanted that to become much more sort of filled with tension in certain ways. And the speed of the plot just got in the way. It was like, oh no, they don't have time for that because now she's been kidnapped. I'm like, well, that kind of gets in the way of things, doesn't it? <laughs> and so some of that is just actually just a function of the way that the story ended up working. Um, in the same way that I ended up ending with Richard Lopez, like, dying, like, those things, like, Richard dying and Naylor killing him, like, that was sort of a discovered thing, and, and similarly it was sort of discovered that, oh, the pace of this and the pressure of the story is so fast that certain relationships aren't going to get developed as much as I might have liked to. Uh, does that relationship, like, you know, spell out in your other book, The Drowned Cities? Or? Uh, with, the, with The Drowned Cities, uh, I actually pick up a whole different cast of characters. Um, and the only character who continues on is Tool. Um, and partly because I became kind of a, he was another strange discovery in the story and I became obsessed with him and so then I wanted to do another story and now I'm writing another book about him as well. Um, where Naylor and Nita will come back into it. Um, but, uh, and hopefully all the characters will kind of circle back into the story, but um, their, their story largely at this point is left to, to readers' imagination about whether that develops further, or what, you know, what Naylor's future is like, or what its potential future is going to be like and stuff. Um, in my mind, without question, his life is going to be a thousand times better than it was before. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, their their relationship. Uh, it, it's there's some stuff in the third book that I'm working on now that that you see more of their relationship and stuff. But. So do you specifically set out to write YA books and then adult books? Do you have the adult book, or are you just I, I do the book and then it's being designated. Yes, I do, partly because of the way that I have contracts set up. So I'm supposed to be writing a book for my young adult publisher at this point, so I'm under contract. So there's some things, like when I was writing The Drowned Cities, uh, I knew I was writing yeah, I was writing the next book in the Shipbreaker series, and it's going to be a YA. Um, it turns out that's actually really hard. Um, there were some things that uh, got into the story that really made The Drowned Cities feel more intense than anything I'd written for adults up until that point, because I ended up writing about child soldiers. And so the Drowned Cities, like a Shipbreaker I wrote and I was feeling like this is an adventure story. I want to be in an adventure story. I want to be telling an adventure story. And but when I was writing the Drowned Cities, it had to be more of a horror story um, in a lot of ways. And it was, um, and that was a surprise. And I felt very uncomfortable because it was intended to be a YA book. And yet it was feeling more and more dark and more and more intense. And I was like, I can't make it not be this way if I'm going to be honest with the stuff that I'm working with, the child soldiering and everything. This is a scary book. You give a 10-year-old a gun, and things get really random and scary really fast. And, and so I knew that I wanted it to be a YA book, but suddenly thematically and, and tonally, 
I was like, wow, there are clearly no rules here because this is going to be a really different book than, you know, and a darker book even than some of my adult stuff, um, which was strange. Um, so, yes, I'm setting out to, you know, tell certain stories to certain uh, age groups and to certain people or readers, ideal readers, my ideal reader, but then the story still takes over. Um, and, and that's, I don't know, I just don't have mastery over it exactly, so it's interesting. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you.